Inspirational movies about dreams are everywhere, and a lot of them turn out to be corny and cheesy. Deadpool Society may be the only one that moved and really influenced me. What makes it so special? Because in the movie, teenage life is tragic, and dreams are painfully realistic. Deadpool Society is a story about a group of teenagers in one of the best high schools in the United States. They're bound to prosper, and it's almost like the path to their future successes has already been mapped out meticulously the moment they were born. There are future bankers, lawyers, doctors among them, and in order not to disappoint their parents, all their lives they've been working towards that one goal, until somebody appears in their lives, their English teacher John Keating. With his unconventional teaching methods, Keating introduced his students to the paradise of the romantic poets. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may, Keating exhorted, telling them to seize their teenage days. Carpe diem, he said, and that became one of the most often quoted sayings in the movie. He hoped that his students can have faith in themselves, not to blindly conform, dare to take the path less traveled, dare to be extraordinary. Because to quote Walt Whitman, the world is a powerful play, it goes on and on and we may contribute a verse. While it's undoubtedly beautiful and romantic to phrase these life lessons through the words of the poets, if the movie stopped progressing here and show us how the students are so inspired to chase their dreams and how their lives turn out to be exceptional, it would be no different than those cliché, inspirational quotes slash life stories you see random people share on Facebook. The interesting part of the movie comes from the second half, where it radically changes its tone and becomes an examination on happiness, dreams, and death. This part of the movie unravels from the moment Neil got the part to play in the drama production. Neil loved acting, he even dreamed of becoming an actor, but his father wanted him to become a doctor. He knew that his dad wouldn't let him play the part, so he held that out on his dad and faked a letter of agreement to the production. On the night of performance, Neil received an ovation due to his remarkable talent, but his father remained unimpressed. He chastised Neil and told him that he would be withdrawn from the school and transferred to a military academy to prepare for university. Neil was distressed. Knowing that his father is never gonna let him pursue a career in acting, he decided to commit suicide the same night. The school conducted a full investigation on the matter, putting the blame on Keating's unconventional teaching. They required the students to sign a document to attest to that. Some were uncooperative and would rather be expelled than to sign the document, but most of them compromised under the threat of expulsion. With sufficient evidence, Keating was fired. The main theme of Deadpool Society is actually how it constantly challenges our traditional definition of happiness from a romanticism standpoint. First, it is the value of success in the traditional sense. One of the things that's special about the story arc is how it detaches success from dream chasing. It didn't tell you with banality how if you don't give up on your dreams, they will come true someday. It showed you if somebody aspires to become an actor, not only that dream is incredibly far-fetched, but they are also left distraught and dead. If someone defends their favorite teacher who made their lives that much more exciting, they get expelled. If someone does not conform to the usual teaching paradigm and insist on upholding their ideals, they get fired in less than a year. Reality is always that cruel to dreams, but it is precisely how the movie detached success from it that the value of dreams and perseverance shine more brightly than ever. When a lot of stories couple the persistence in dream chasing and the eventual success, we think to ourselves, if we're getting the best of both worlds, what's the struggle? But in the face of the cruelty of reality, at the point where we must choose between the two, inevitably we ask ourselves, what's really worth pursuing? Is it the romance of the dreams, or is it the eventual success, where dreams and persistence are only the means to an end? Like a philosopher, the movie presents the audience with a thought experiment. To find out which one of two values do we value more, we don't imagine a world where we can obtain both of them, albeit possible. We imagine the case where they conflict. If we want to find out whether we value our own existence in reality or happiness more, we don't imagine us existing in everyday reality and being happy although that is more than possible. We ask ourselves to choose between being plugged into a simulated reality where we can be as happy as we want, versus existing in the real world even though it may be full of pain. The thought experiment constructed is exactly the famous experience machine argument by philosopher Robert Nozick. 
In the same vein, the movie realistically tells us that oftentimes believing in your dreams and actually accomplishing them does not have an inevitable causal relationship. In this case, do we value the brief sparkle of romance more than a successful life and the security that comes with it? The story goes on to challenge our attitude to life and death. The theme of death is a subtle yet recurring one in the movie, and you can even say that it is the actual main motif of the story. From Keating's first lesson where he led the students to a room full of pictures of school alumni with a poem, to the virgins make much of time was mentioned, and how the flowers smiling today will be dying tomorrow. Too many poems and verses mentioned later involve the relationship between life and death. One of the most memorable lessons that Keating taught his students was when he said that medicine, law, business, engineering, these are noble pursuits and necessary to sustain life, but poetry, beauty, romance, love, these are what people stay alive for. Keating went on to quote Whitman's O Me, O Life, in a grim and seemingly hopeless society portrayed where everything appears to be so aimless, we can't help but to ask ourselves what good amid these, what motivates us to keep going. And for Whitman, the answer is that we're still living, life, exists, and identity. The commencement of a meeting of the Dead Poets Society features a paragraph from Thoreau's Walden, in which life and death again serve as the central theme. Thoreau went to live in the woods because he wanted to experience the essence of life, to live deep and suck out all the marrows of life, so that he wouldn't, when he dies, discover that he had not lived. After Neil's suicide, Keating revisited this paragraph, emotionally overwhelmed, heartbroken, and cried. From the traditional point of view that society has implicitly imposed on us, death is basically the worst thing that can happen to a person. Which is also why we categorize this movie as a tragedy in the first place. But wouldn't we be guilty of having the exact mindset that the movie set out to challenge through these verses? See, for the writers, one thing may very well be worse than dying. That is, to lose your identity, to never have written down a verse of your own, and to find out that you have not lived when you die. For Neil, he understood clearly that after this attempt of rebellion, he would have to follow the path his family laid down for him. At least for the next 10 years, all he would be doing was to study medicine. Even though that was no Broadway, taking part in that production may be the only point in his life where his individuality truly takes the main stage and shines. If life is mundane and ordinary after this digression, even if he would have everything to sustain life, but what he's staying alive for is lost. Then for Neil, the suicide wasn't a tragedy, because he'd contributed his own short but original verse, he had truly lived. In this regard, Neil's suicide was romantic, it was emancipating and happy even. But the narrative of the movie isn't pushed further, till this point only questions are being raised, using romanticism to challenge a world overshadowed by realism. Unlike many other, the movie did not conspicuously advocate for the romantics, because we all know that it's foolish to say definitively that one of two values is more noble and worth pursuing. For every line like this, But only in their dreams can men be truly free. It was always thus, and always thus will be. There will always be a response like this. Show me the heart unfettered by foolish dreams, and I'll show you a happy man. At the end, the movie passed the struggle and decision back to us. We can choose to be like Charlie, to defend the teacher who has enlightened you with the lyrics of the romantics, adamant even in the threat of expulsion. Or we can be like Todd and the others, to compromise in the face of reality. Either way, Keating wouldn't say that you're wrong. Because at the end of the day, Keating himself is not exactly the resolute advocate for romanticism either. As he said, See, there's a time for daring, and there's a time for caution. A wise man understands which is called for. We are left with the choices, the trade-offs, and the compromises to make to struggle through life. And I think he would just hope, merely, that we don't forget a teacher like him ever existed. Thank you, boys. Thank you.